Welcome to this Actuarial Research Center webinar on the research program Modeling, Measurement and Management of Longevity and Morbidity Risks. I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us today. I'm Stephen Haberman, I'm Associate Director of the Actuarial Research Center and I'm your Chairman. Um, let me just say a few words of introduction about the ARC. It's a network of actuarial researchers around the world. Our aim is to do cutting-edge cutting edge research that addresses the global challenges facing actuarial science. Our aim is to do research that impacts on practitioners and policymakers, and research that involves a partnership between academia, practitioners, and the actuarial profession. The research program that we're going to speak about today is jointly funded by the ARC, the Society of Actuaries, and the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. I now have great pleasure in handing over to Andrew Cairns, Professor Andrew Cairns, who's principal investigator of today's research program. Thank you very much, Stephen. So in, in this webinar, I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, this uh, large research program that we'll be running over the next uh, few years uh, on uh, longevity and morbidity risk. And uh, the idea of the webinar is to give you uh, just an idea of the fla a flavor of the uh, what's going on within the program in terms of what we've already done, uh, and then also uh, what's going to be coming up uh, over the next few years. So before I, I give you just a, a quick overview of the, uh, the, the, in terms of the program, uh, we'll go immediately into a, a poll just to get you warmed up, the audience, uh, and uh, get you used to using the uh, polls. We'll, we'll have five polls in total during the webinar. And uh, the question that's uh, coming up is, uh, what age do you expect to live to? So is it less than 70, 70 to 79, 80 to 89, 90 to 99, or over 100? So we have a, a few minutes, uh, or a few seconds rather, for you to uh, think about that. And, uh, and then once you've made up uh, your mind, then you can uh, uh, click on whichever button you think is uh, appropriate for your own circumstances. So we can see the numbers are uh, racking up at the moment. Uh, quite a good number that have gone for the 80 to 89, but uh, plenty of you that are voting at the moment for other uh, options. But we'll give you a few more seconds because there's still uh, quite a few people that are uh, online and it uh, uh, looks like you've still got to, got to vote. And if I understand the technology correctly, that you, you need to vote for you to be able to see the results. So. Uh, make sure you do click on one of the buttons. OK, so well, I think uh, that that's a, a good start. So I think most people have uh, uh, voted now. So we've got a, a clear majority that are going for the 80 to 89 bracket. But, uh, and then uh, the, the next largest are, are the uh, people that hope to live uh, even longer. So, uh, but what, what we expect here, because of course that this is all introducing the theme of the research program, uh, that uh, it's getting you to, and during the webinar to think about uh, mortality and life expectancy uh, from an individual perspective, but also uh, at, at the, the population level. And that the variation that we see in the uh, results just in this one question might reflect things like uh, your own current age, uh, what's your current health, where do you live in terms of different parts of the world, uh, do you build in improvements in uh, future mortality rates and are you a born pessimist or a born optimist in terms of uh, your own life expectancy? So uh, moving back to the, the slides now, uh, so that the plan for the session is first of all to give you a, an introduction, so this is in the first part of the, the session, an introduction to the uh, longevity and morbidity research program. Uh, and this is the forward-looking part of the, the, the talk where we're just introducing some of the themes that are going to be coming up. Uh, but I'll talk about the sponsors, the research team, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the, the impact that we hope to achieve during the course of the research. We'll then have a few minutes for uh, questions from the audience. And uh, you don't need to wait until that particular point in the session to uh, type in questions uh, uh, on your own uh, laptops or iPads. You can type in questions at any point during the, the webinar. Uh, and then we'll go back to a, a few more slides where I will be talking about uh, uh, research that we've done uh, so far, just to give you a little bit of a taster. 
uh, and that will be based on uh, a Danish mortality and in particular looking at health inequalities and then we'll finish off with uh, a, a opportunity for some further questions. So uh, moving on, so uh, first of all we want to mention uh, all of our sponsors who've been uh, already mentioned but I'll, I'll say them again. So we uh, we're very grateful that the, the research is being supported by, in a very substantial way by the Institute and uh, Faculty of Actuaries through the Actuarial Research Centre uh, and also the Society of Actuaries and the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. And uh, uh, what we will be doing within the research is we, we will be doing bits and pieces of research and, and other activities which are tailored to the uh, uh, the requirements of the individual sponsors. So for, on the research side, for example, uh, we would be uh, perhaps looking at uh, data sets that come from the United States and also Canada, as well as the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, and then we also plan to do uh, knowledge exchange activities in, in all three of the, uh, the, the host countries. Briefly introducing the research team, so uh, I'm uh, uh, Andrew Cairns, the principal investigator based at Harriet Watts University, uh, so I'll be the, the uh, front man for the, the research, uh, and then I'll be supported by a number of co-investigators on the, the program, uh, uh, Angus, George and Torsten, who are based uh, also at Harriet Watts University, and then we have a, 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 a three other co-investigators who are uh, based at uh, Cass Business School, uh, University of Southampton and Longevitas, so that's David Blake, Erin Gould-Dodd and Stephen Richards. And then uh, in terms of the actual funding that we have for the research, uh, a substantial part of that will go towards the hiring of uh, two postdoctoral researchers and uh, three PhD students. And then lastly, uh, we also have uh, collaborations that are part of this uh, research programme uh, with researchers who are based in uh, Aarhus in Denmark, at Durham University and in California. So th this slide that I've moved on to now, this is really uh, by way of motivation for why we are looking at uh, developing stochastic mortality models and in particular for actuarial applications. So we're uh, looking at uh, England and Wales mortality and this is just by way of example uh, and uh, males uh, mortality. And we've got uh, 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 four different ages, 25 up to 85, and we're looking at mortality rates. How have these changed over the last 100 years or 110 years or, or so? And then within each plot, uh, the, the, the actual numbers on the, the y-axis, if you can see the hand uh, moving up and down on the, uh, within the, the slide itself, uh, the, the, the numbers are different, but the, the sort of relative scales are the same, and that, and that means that you can compare the rates of mortality improvement, or the different rates rather, uh, you can see how these are different at these different ages. So if we look first of all at age 25, then uh, we can see that there are perhaps three different periods of uh, mortality improvement. So uh, 1900 up to about 1940, uh, the, there, are, uh, there are some sort of modest improvements over that period interrupted by the, the two world wars, and then a, a steeper phase uh, of mortality improvements, uh, perhaps largely due to the introduction of penicillin, uh, and then a, a flatter period uh, uh, after the, uh, around about 1960 or so, and then more recently a, a, a bit of an improvement uh, once again. So that's one pattern of improvement. Uh, if we then look at age 45, it's uh, rather different, and we can see here that the mortality improvements at this age have been relatively steady over the uh, uh, last uh, 100 years or, or so. Age 65 and age 85 are, are perhaps relatively similar in terms of the pattern, but uh, the, the magnitude of the improvements are different. But what we see here are not much change in uh, 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 up, up to maybe about around about 1970 or 1980, so fairly flat, uh, and then uh, more significant improvements in mortality at age 65 and also age 85 uh, from 1980 onwards. But also we can see that uh, comparing these two, although the, the pattern is somehow the same, that uh, at age 85 the, the actual relative improvements has been uh, rather smaller as reflected in the uh, 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 lower uh, or the, the less slope that we see in that particular plot. So what do we take away from these plots? Uh, we can see 
different patterns of improvement uh, uh, or different rates of improvement over different time periods. So for a, for a particular single age, we see different rates of improvement over different time periods. Uh, but we also see uh, uh, different rates of improvement at different ages. Thirdly, uh, we have different patterns of improvement at the different ages as well, so, uh, as, uh, as I've just discussed. And so that, that these different patterns need to be uh, something that we can uh, take care of when we're choosing stochastic mortality models uh, in the work that we're doing. And that, uh, that, that, of course, might depend on the age range that we want to do within a particular uh, 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 mortality study. And then lastly, uh, over both the short and the long term, you can see that there's a certain amount of volatility and uncertainty. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that we would expect to see in the future, or uh, uh, that volatility, but also it reflects the fact that we just simply at this point in time don't know exactly uh, how things are going to pan out in the future. So we'll go back now to uh, the second of the polls. Uh, so you've seen that uh, history for uh, the England and Wales males. Uh, so the question uh, for the audience now is, what do you think is a reasonable assumption per annum for mortality improvements in the 60 to 70 age group uh, over the next 20 years? So the, the options for you are less than 0%, 0 to 1%, 1 to 2%, uh, 2 to 3 more than 3%. And depending upon your background, uh, uh, whether you're working in this particularly in this area or working in a different area, you may uh, uh, opt for the, uh, the don't know answer down at the bottom. So we can see, uh, you can have a, a think about that and then uh, you can uh, click on one of the options. And in terms of the answers that you might come up with here, well, there, there may be a bit of guesswork on your part or the, the answer that you, you choose, well, that might be framed by the options that uh, are, are given to you. Uh, or hopefully there will be a number of you out there who, uh, because of the area that you work in, uh, you will be using your own judgment and uh, uh, be choosing values that are going to be linked to the uh, particular uh, valuations that you might be working on and the assumptions uh, that you're making in that. So we've got most people uh, having voted now and uh, the, uh, the 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 clear favourite at the moment, just, just under 50%. Uh, and of course, as I talk, more people keep on voting, but the, the pattern is still the same. Uh, so that you can see that there's a clear majority in the uh, uh, 1 to 2%. And, uh, and, and the next favourite is the uh, 0 to 1%, and a few that are 2 to 3. Okay, so well that, that's poll number 2. And then poll number 3, if we can move on to that, is building on uh, that previous question. So this next question, it's perhaps a little bit more challenging. Uh, so in the last one, you've made your own central forecast, uh, but then how much uncertainty is there in the, the actual outcome? So how much uncertainty is there around that central forecast? And again, this is uh, over the next uh, 20 years. So the first option is none, so it will be exactly as I predict, uh, or it might be plus or minus uh, half a percent, plus or minus one, plus or minus one and a half, plus or minus two, and again, don't know if you uh, don't feel uh, quite so confident. Uh, and in thinking about this question, uh, it's, I'll, I'll le I'm leaving it to you to interpret how extreme uh, the uncertainty is. So it, it could be one, one stand, plus or minus one standard deviation or two standard deviations, uh, or maybe up to the sort of solvency two type of uh, level of risk. And the key thing in terms of asking this question, it, it links to the bigger research program. It, it's all about getting you, uh, the, the audience, the actuaries, to think about uh, how much uncertainty is there in your forecasts. So the votes are coming in uh, thick and fast now. The numbers are going up and down, and the plus or minus 2% was uh, trying to make a last minute comeback, but, <laughs> but they've uh, fallen back now. Uh, so the Majority is uh, saying plus or minus 1% uh, uh, and 2% is the, the, the next uh, uh, favourite. So whatever the exact number is, uh, that, that doesn't matter so much. It's, it's more the, uh, uh, again, the, the fact that you are, are thinking about uh, how much uncertainty there is because that, that's one of the key themes in the research programme. 
So back to the, uh, the, the, the main slides. Um, so we're thinking uh, in a lot of the research that we're going to be doing, we're focusing on longevity risk. And this is the risk that uh, uh, people live in aggregate longer than anticipated. And uh, I would stress in aggregate, so if we're, this is as opposed to looking at individuals, so individuals might die early or late, uh, but it, it, what we're thinking about from an actuarial perspective is, is on average, are people living longer than anticipated? And the anticipated part uh, is what, where we build in potentially, if we want to do so, uh, we can build in what we think will be mortality improvements in the future. Uh, and it, it's uh, the, the risk then is that despite these uh, best efforts to predict future mortality, that uh, people still live longer than anticipated, and then we have financial consequences associated with that. So as we saw previously in the plot of the England and Wales data, the, the data itself uh, tells us that there will be an uncertain future. And so what we're trying to do is to model and measure the more longevity risk uh, uh, for a variety of actuarial applications. And the first of these is simply general risk assessment. And this would be part of a good overall package of enterprise risk management. Uh, and then we have uh, a number of other bullet points which are really picking up on the decisions that you might make uh, which are based on that assessment of risk. So the first is to do with pricing, uh, where you might want to build in a, a margin in your pricing for the systematic risk that uh, you, you carry in your, say, annuity portfolio. Uh, and then you have a, a number of uh, issues connected to reserving. So it might be either in the runoff of a portfolio or it might be reserving uh, calculations based on a one-year time horizon, as we would do for Solvency 2. Uh, and then in the other sort of direction, uh, the, the models that we would be thinking about developing uh, would help us to assess what, what is the diversification benefit that you might get by having uh, two populations with perhaps different characteristics, perhaps uh, assured lives and uh, an annuity portfolio, or males and females, or even a, a sort of multinational portfolio. And then the last one uh, bullet is a slightly different one. It's a sort of higher level still in terms of decision making. Uh, and this is where you've perhaps decided that you want to uh, reduce your exposure to longevity risk. And what you're wanting to use these models for is to assess the effectiveness of risk reduction as a result of putting a hedge in place. So in the, uh, the work that we're going to be doing, we'll be, in general, we'll be thinking about two things. Uh, one will be generating central forecasts for mortality. But uh, more importantly, perhaps what we also want to do is to focus on uh, how much uncertainty there is around the central forecasts. And that really relates to the, the last of the, the polls that we had just uh, a few minutes ago. Now, within that work, so with those general objectives, what we're looking at uh, as part of the program would be trying to understand and document how stochastic models are currently used in practice. And what we're looking for as part of that work is to just identify where the gaps might be in terms of uh, what people are doing, and then looking for opportunities for improving on the models and also how, how the models are used, uh, and also delivering uh, 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 some training events which will help people to uh, users to uh, make the best use of the models that we and others might uh, uh, develop. Then we have the, the more specific research, uh, which will be based around developing uh, single population models and also multi-population models. And on the single population front, we'll be trying to develop models which are more uh, appropriate for a wider range than, range than is often used uh, at the moment, because uh, often models at the moment are used in, in a, say, a, an age 50 to age 90 sort of age range, particularly pension populations. Um, but we want to be able to think, can we develop models which are good for a wider range of ages, perhaps down to 30 or 25 or thereabouts. And when we're doing that, what we're looking for is uh, also developing uh, what uh, I would describe as flexible and also robust estimation procedures, which are perhaps a variation on the methods that have been used uh, in the past. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we want to think about in the modeling work that we're developing that to trying to introduce greater flexibility in how people model central forecasts. And the idea behind this particular uh, point is that uh, users of these models uh, often have quite strong views in terms of uh, what they think is an appropriate central forecast for future mortality rates. 
but they perhaps have less strong views on the amount of uncertainty that goes around that. And so that means that uh, people will often uh, do one thing for central forecasts and then they might import up a uh, stochastic model simply to uh, look at uh, how much uncertainty that there is around that. Then we go back to the uh, new multi-population uh, uh, models. And uh, a key point here is uh, to think about uh, getting new data sets. And in particular, multi-population modeling, what we're trying to do is, in some cases, is to model uh, something like a pension plan or a life insurance portfolio to model that alongside the uh, national mortality. Um, also, we want to think about how to handle smaller populations and again, robust, developing robust models. And then lastly, as a sort of distinct point, uh, is to think about uh, generating realistic correlation term structure between the populations and also between different age groups and over time. So here, I've, in both cases, I've stressed the, the idea of robustness and what, what I mean here, or my uh, interpretation of that is robust relative to things like outliers in data, robust relative to the range of ages that you use, and then lastly, if you add in one extra calendar year of data, you want the uh, fit of the model to adjust slightly, but not to change uh, uh, by a very significant amount. So we want that robustness in our models, and by really testing these models to destruction almost, uh, what we're doing in, as, in, as the researchers is that we, will, we are helping the potential users to have greater confidence in the models that uh, they might uh, use in the future. Another thing that we'll be looking, at, uh, looking out for during the programme is any emerging themes in the mortality area. And just as one example uh, of that, uh, there's been some growing discussion in the UK and Canada and other countries about uh, has there been a step change in the uh, rates of improvement uh, in, in these uh, uh, two countries. Uh, so how do we model this and uh, uh, what are the longer term consequences? So things, this brings us on to the, the fourth poll. So the background to this, first of all, before we get to the question, is that uh, looking at the UK, for example, uh, between 1995 and 2015, UK male ex life expectancy from age 65. This has increased by about four years. However, uh, in the last five of those years, uh, the rate of increase has approximately halved. So that would equate to two years per 20 rather than four years per 20. So the question is, uh, what do you think uh, will be uh, improvements in life expectancy over the next 20 years again? Uh, so will it be, and this, uh, the, the words that I'm using here are relative to the past 20 years, so four years out of 20 as the sort of benchmark. So will it be much lower, lower, about the same or higher? And then th these are interpreted as being uh, uh, up to uh, one year in terms of uh, an improvement in life expectancy. And of course, that, that could be, in fact, negative rather than uh, positive. Uh, lower would be plus one to plus three years. About the same would be uh, three to five years increase in life expectancy. And then higher uh, might be uh, at plus five years or more. So we can see the votes uh, coming in uh, slowly at the moment. Uh, so we'll give you a, a few more seconds to register your vote on this one. But at the, the moment, uh, the, there's a, again a, a clear majority, or in fact a, a much more clear majority than the other polls, that uh, uh, people are focusing on the sort of plus one to plus three years. So the, the, the clear view within the audience is that the slowdown that we've exhibited over the last uh, five years or so uh, is going to uh, probably continue. And then roughly equal numbers on either side of that. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Uh, so what we started off there, but really I had introduced that by just describing the, the picture within the UK, but it, we, what we think is it's a very good idea to in order to think about what might happen in the UK, it's a good idea to look at other countries by way of comparison. Uh, so this plot, and, and then on the, the next slide as well, uh, we're comparing what's happened in the UK and we're comparing that with uh, five other countries. 
Um, uh, so the, in this particular plot, we're looking at the retired population, so uh, average mortality over the ages 60 up to 89. Uh, and uh, uh, for these six countries, you can see uh, a generally improving trend in these uh, average mortality rates, uh, but all, all of these at quite uh, different levels. And then uh, we've got the black line uh, roughly in the middle, which is the uh, England and Wales mortality. And we can see how that uh, between 2000 and 2010 in particular, there was a period of fairly strong improvements, uh, but then a, a leveling off, not quite leveling off, but still improving a little bit uh, after 2011. Uh, and a similar picture for Canada, which is the uh, pink purple uh, sort of line, which is nearer uh, the bottom. So we can certainly see in this picture that uh, we, we do have a bit of a slowdown that you can observe in these rates. Uh, but of course, when you look at some of the other populations, uh, uh, you maybe see a bit of a slowdown also in the United States. Uh, but for the other countries, Denmark, Japan and uh, Sweden, uh, you can see that uh, the improvements that have been over the previous 10 years, that these improvements are continuing uh, over the more recent five years. And in particular, uh, when you look at uh, Sweden and Japan down at the bottom, so these are amongst the best in terms of uh, low mortality rates, the, these are continuing to improve at the same rate. Uh, of course, that, that rate of improvement was not as strong as England and Wales over the previous 10 years. It's maybe about just under 2% as an improvement rate across that range of ages, but it's continuing at that same rate. And, uh, that there's nothing in those particular uh, countries' data to indicate that there's a, a slowdown likely to happen there. And so you might take away from that that you may perhaps want to be slightly cautious in terms of assuming that the uh, slowdown that we see in the UK and in Canada, that that slowdown will continue uh, for a long time into the future. Because eventually uh, we would hope that, uh, that the UK would want to try to catch up through government policy catch up with the, the, the leaders, uh, uh, which he, here would be Japan and Sweden. Uh, this plot is uh, uh, more or less showing the same thing, but this is a, a slightly younger age group, 45 up to 54. And uh, the, the rankings of the different countries are perhaps quite uh, different and more spread out. Uh, and of course, the, with the US up at the top there, uh, there's been quite a lot of debate within the United States in terms of why are, are things looking quite so bad uh, within that population and trying to understand which groups within the population uh, are, are causing these relatively high mortality rates. But for the UK and uh, Canada, we can see even more so the, the flattening off. Uh, but once again, Japan and Sweden, uh, the uh, mortality improvements are continuing at the same rate over the last five years. And once again, these are down at the bottom. So these are the best in terms of uh, their, their own mortality. So in terms of my own uh, point of view, I, I'm perhaps more cautious in terms of saying, has there been a slowdown? I, I would be uh, myself more inclined to go for a, a slightly higher improvement rate than perhaps the majority in, in the last poll. So this is just one example of uh, an emerging issue, but uh, it gives a, a flavor of what we will be thinking about, uh, as we will certainly be doing in the, this particular case for the, the future. So now just moving on, thinking about some other bits of the, the program. So uh, we'll be looking at uh, longevity risk management. So what are the options for managing uh, longevity risk? So that might range from uh, no action through uh, customized longevity swaps uh, into uh, index-based options. Uh, so we want to consider all possibilities. And these, of course, are all quite different. And because of these differences, we need to think about the fact that there is going to be a trade-off between uh, the price that you have to pay for a particular hedge versus the residual risk. And in order to do that uh, in a, a rigorous sort of way, what you need to have is, first of all, uh, an appropriate stochastic model to assess the residual risk. But then also what you need is a, a well-articulated risk appetite in order to come up with a decision about which uh, hedge is going to be best for your particular uh, business. So uh, the sorts of things where the, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, risk appetite might come in, well, it might be related to regulatory or uh, economic capital, or it might be going one step beyond that and looking at the impact on the economic value of the uh, 
uh, the, the portfolio that you're looking at. Um, and then lastly, uh, uh, as a slightly different type of question, what, what are the barriers to innovation? So this is really to do with the uh, options that are available. So things like looking at data accuracy, uh, can we develop ways to hedge the longevity risk for active pension plan members rather than the more usual uh, uh, retired population only? What happens if counterparties disagree on price? Uh, and then lastly, uh, 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 what about regulatory approval in terms of uh, what, what hedges are going to be admissible and what, uh, how do we ensure that the different options get fair treatment across the board? And then another line of work that we will be doing is looking at critical illness insurance and the, more, and the underlying morbidity risks, and, and that will be led by my colleague George Streftaris. Uh, so here this will be looking at current and emerging morbidity risks, uh, looking at underlying drivers, and that, that will link to the mortality work uh, that, that we're doing, the, the really focused in uh, looking at the details in terms of mortality. A focus will probably be more short term compared to the mortality modeling that we'll be doing because uh, critical illnesses are in some ways is a rather more challenging type of product to look at and to analyze the data. And we'll be looking at developing some innovative estimation methods as well as innovative models uh, for this. And then we'll be using different data from uh, different sources. So CMI will be the, uh, the main source of data, but we'll also think about using some other national uh, databases within the UK. And then we're also looking at whether we can get some uh, further data from the Asia Pacific area. Now, in terms of uh, outputs from the uh, research program, so we're planning to produce a number of uh, research papers and articles, which will be published in uh, uh, research-oriented journals and also magazines. Everything that we publish will be regarded as open access, which means that anybody can download the articles for, uh, for no fee. Uh, and uh, uh, at least in the first instance, uh, uh, all of these uh, will be available on this, uh, this website here. And that this would include uh, slides and presentations from uh, a variety of conferences, as well as the papers. Data that we're going to be using, uh, where, where feasible, this will be open access, although there may be uh, for some data sets, there, there may be some confidentiality uh, issues that we might have to uh, uh, take account of, and might, that might prevent us from uh, uh, making that, that data available. And then there's a variety of events where we're uh, going to be speaking at, so uh, sessional meetings in particular. Uh, so that the first of these is planned for January 2018, uh, but then a variety of other IFOA conferences and uh, uh, conferences uh, organised by uh, other bodies. And then uh, lastly, uh, case studies and uh, impact. So impact is very important as a part of this research program. Uh, and uh, what we're trying, thinking about here is, for example, uh, adoption of the, the new models that uh, we're developing by you and the audience, you the users. Uh, and you might be using uh, uh, these models to assess the impact of longevity risk on your, your business. Uh, uh, as well as uh, other things, and uh, uh, that impact we, uh, uh, in part, will be facilitated through uh, the us, us running uh, uh, training events, uh, either through the IFOA or uh, through uh, invitations from uh, a variety of uh, organizations. And part of the training and the, the, the publications is to try to develop increased confidence in the use of these models by, by yourselves. Uh, then we th have uh, regulation, so we want to see uh, if we can help the stochastic models to be embedded in regulations. Uh, and lastly, innovation in risk management. So uh, that, that ends the first part, and we're, we're now uh, open to uh, questions. So if you haven't already typed some questions, then we can, uh, uh, you, you, can you certainly have the opportunity to do so uh, just now. So we have some questions that have come through. and. Um I, I will put them to Andrew. The first is, there's a difference between correlation and causation, and you seem to be looking at correlation in your models. Um, is that going to be enough for developing robust models? Uh, well, certainly, uh, the statistical type of work that we do and the approach that we take is very much more focused, I would say, on identifying correlations. Uh, uh, but it depends on the, the particular data sets that we're looking at. So. Uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, 
focusing in on things like uh, cause of death as well as covariates, which I'll touch upon in the, the next part of the webinar, where there are things like education, where there's a, an element of causality, uh, as some people might uh, say. Uh, and that's as opposed to uh, another measure that I'll talk about in the, the second part, which is affluence, which is more that, it's more that this is correlated with uh, uh, levels of mortality, but it, it's uh, a rather stronger predictor, I, I would argue. So uh, there are these differences, but uh, uh, we're certainly very mindful of uh, these differences. And, but, but often we, we, we want to sort of back off describing something definitively as being a sort of causal driver, because it, it, I think the real world is perhaps a rather more complex thing than that. But, but those are the sorts of things that we definitely do want to uh, uh, discuss when, when we're doing our research and to you know, put, put those thoughts into writing just to for the users of these models to have a good understanding in terms of really what, what are the limitations of what we do as well as what we think are the positives. But uh, the users need to be aware that uh, a lot of what we might do would be described as modeling the correlations rather than saying this is a, definitively a causal variable. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so another, another question. Um, one of our listeners watchers has said, I'm concerned there are no women in the group heading up the research team. What are you doing to ensure a diverse input? Oh, very good question. Uh, well, we do have uh, amongst our wider group of researchers uh, uh, some uh, female members. So for example, uh, in uh, uh, Aarhus, uh, one of my uh, uh, longer standing research collaborators that we've been working with on the, the Danish data, and also one of our PhD students uh, is also a female. So. Uh, in that sense, uh, it, it's, uh, there's a, a, a bit of representation, but uh, clearly, yes, I mean, it, we can do more, but it, it's uh, up, up to the audience to also uh, chip in if you feel we're uh, falling short in any ways, then uh, certainly become involved if you want to. Um, there's two questions about pensioners versus insured lives. Um, most of the mortality improvement seems to be about pensioners. Should we be thinking about younger ages and insured lives in particular? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I guess from the financial perspective, the, uh, and I suppose when I'm think, th thinking about longevity risk, I would always be thinking about uh, pensioners and yeah. annuitants because yeah. it's living longer which causes the financial uh, problems. Uh, but for insured lives, certainly these models can be uh, adapted uh, in, uh, and for, for use. But uh, to some extent, uh, with, uh, when you're looking at insured lives, the, time scales are shorter and then uh, some of the things you need to focus on perhaps are what perhaps are not so much the longer term trend changes but also what are the possibilities of big shocks such as a, a pandemic or something of that sort. Uh, so that, that's something that I, I do think about from time to time and uh, 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 it, it's uh, certainly in our minds but uh, that, uh, so we, we'll be thinking about that and we'll keep it on our list of things to do. Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting point because it touches on one of the questions that's come in. Do the data allow for extreme events? Will your research take into consideration p potential pandemics and so on? So that requires, yeah, I guess, yeah. a different type of model. Yes. Well, a different type of model, but also uh, when, when it comes to these extreme events, and you know, I guess you're getting into the realms of solvency two probabilities as well, yeah. that uh, the, uh, the data itself, you maybe only have uh, 100 years worth of observations and you're trying to get a, a one in 200 year event. So at that stage, you are very much more into the area of thinking about more, more like scenario analysis. Uh, and I should say also that as part of the research that what, apart from developing the stochastic models, that, that what we're trying to do is also, uh, and this is in fact through some suggestions from the members of our steering group, is to uh, think about uh, developing some single or a, a set, set of scenario tests that people can do. So rather than running a full uh, stochastic uh, uh, simulation that you might also just have a set of three or four extreme scenarios of which th this would be exactly the sort of thing uh, that, that, that we could do that. But, but that also requires a certain amount of expert judgment. I'm going to carry a couple of the questions through to the second half because I think you're going to touch on some of the um, underlying themes then, but just one more now. To what extent is the modeling approach expected to be extrapolative versus forward looking, for example, using medical modeling? Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of the, 
what we have, as a group, have done in the past. Typically, that has been more uh, uh, in terms of extrapolative modeling, so making sure that the, the statistics is at the forefront of uh, uh, what we do. Uh, but we're also starting to move in, in the di uh, direction of thinking about uh, uh, more specific uh, medical advances, and, th and that, that requires you to start to look at uh, sort of cause of death data. Uh, but you have to be quite cautious in terms of using that. So rather than uh, put the extrapolative models to one side completely and then focus on the cause of death modeling, my, my own view here would be to stick with the extrapolative models, perhaps with some tweaks in terms of central forecasts, uh, but then to think, well, for a particular stochastic scenario that's come out of this, this uh, particular model, what would need to happen in terms of individual causes of death uh, for that to happen. And then you, you can sort of see, well, perhaps some of these stochastic scenarios are completely implausible, uh, or perhaps they're, they're maybe not extreme enough. Well, I think the causes of death question actually takes us nicely onto the second part of your presentation. Yeah. So let, let's right. pick that up. So if we can go back to the slides, please. So the, the, the case study is based on uh, uh, some work that we've been doing on uh, Danish mortality modeling. Uh, Danish mortality statistics. Uh, the data itself comes from uh, Statistics Denmark and their National Register database. Uh, we've got one paper that's complete and that's available uh, online, uh, but we have a number of uh, other lines of research which are very active and ongoing, and I'll, I'll touch upon those in the uh, next few slides. Uh, so the, the data that we have is uh, it covers every single individual who is resident in uh, Denmark and uh, all sorts of data gets collected on this one database and so it's a, uh, it's a very rich database which is much more complete than uh, we would have in other countries. Um, now amongst that database we have lots of useful information or what you might call as covariates for in terms of predicting mortality rates. Uh, the, in the work that we've done so far we've focused on separately income and wealth as two pieces of information that's on, that are on that database. Um, and through a combination of these, we, we did find that income on its own and wealth on its own, neither of these were as good as in terms of predicting mortality compared to this uh, quantity that we call affluence, which is a simple combination of uh, an individual's income and wealth. So the, the, the research that we've completed so far is based on this particular bit of information that we have uh, available on that database. But there's lots of other things uh, on the database, such as uh, educational attainment, marital status, occupation, health information, cause of death. Uh, and so because of that, as I say, we, we've got a database which is very much richer than in many countries, including the United Kingdom, uh, where, at least in terms of published mortality, uh, the mortality is typically by occupation group uh, only or by some uh, different socioeconomic groups. So this is a very, it's a very big data set uh, which is good from that uh, from one perspective but it also the richness of that data also causes challenge in terms of the uh, ease of access to the database and also the challenges in terms of analyzing that data. So these two plots uh, here, these now uh, give a snapshot of uh, what we've done uh, in terms of affluence. Uh, so we use this uh, affluence index for each individual. We use that to allocate each individual in the population to one of 10 groups from low affluence up to high affluence. And uh, we then measure the uh, death rates for these 10 affluence groups. Uh, up to 1 to 10, and the, the two plots here are the mortality curves for the year 2012. Um, and uh, uh, with similar pictures for other years. Now, on the left-hand side, uh, what you can see is there is lots of randomness because Denmark itself is not a big population, uh, and then we're dividing it into 10 uh, for these uh, affluence uh, subgroups, so there's quite a lot of noise within the death counts, but nevertheless, you can even within the crude data, you can all already see that there is a, quite a big difference between the uh, low affluence up at the, the top in terms of high mortality rates and the high affluence people are down at the bottom in terms of low mortality rates. Then what we do, we, we take the, the crude mortality data uh, and we 
and this is a key part of the research, is to look at uh, developing an appropriate model. So there's a, a large part of the process here is selecting a, a one model out of a, a range of possibilities until we get uh, a good fit without any significant loss in terms of the structure. So after a bit of model fitting, we get the uh, uh, picture on the right-hand side. So these are the smoothed death rates uh, using that uh, for, for the year 2012. And we can now see a, a very clear separation between all 10 of these uh, uh, different uh, subgroups. Uh, we can then also see, uh, in terms of what, what do we take away from this plot, we can see that the, the biggest differences are at the, the younger age of uh, 55. Uh, and this, this difference is uh, around about uh, five to six times higher mortality in uh, the, 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 the low affluence group compared to the high affluence. Uh, and that gr difference narrows gradually as we go up to the highest age of 95, uh, where it's around about 1.3 times. Uh, so that was mortality rates, and it has been important in that work to look at mortality rates first before then looking at alternative headline statistics, such as uh, uh, life expectancy for these 10 groups. So we've got life expectancies here for uh, three different ages, uh, with the, the biggest differences uh, being at the younger age because of the difference in the, the spreads of mortality uh, that we saw in the previous plot. Uh, so we see very big differences at that age between groups 1 down at the bottom, group 10 up at the top. And it's maybe not totally clear in this plot, but the gap between group 1 and group 10 has actually got a little bit wider over the uh, last 28 years rather than, uh, than narrowing. Although what you can see more obviously is that the, the, the difference between groups 1 and 2, that that has narrowed. So in some sense, group 1 has uh, had a little bit of a catch up relative to that uh, second group. And then, but similar levels of uh, inequality, but that, that there, there is this narrowing uh, uh, group. But again, again, you can see in all, all of these plots a very clear separation between the different affluence groups. Moving on, and this is more recent uh, work that is ongoing now, is to look at education as an alternative to affluence. So education, it's, here it's only subdivided into three groups rather than the 10 that we have for affluence low, medium, and high education. Uh, and here we're looking at uh, mortality for the age groups uh, 45 up to 54. And uh, down at the bottom, we've got the uh, affluence group number 10. So that, that's the wealthy people in the population. So that's a steady improvement over the last uh, 28 years. Uh, that, the sort of rate of improvement is somewhat similar for the high education group. That's the, the, the thick red line. Up at the top, at the other end, we've got the low affluence group one, uh, where there have been a rather, have been some improvements, but rather slow compared to group 10. Uh, and then in the middle, we've got the uh, low education group, where there have been really no observable improvements at all. And that's over a very long period of uh, 28 years. So education itself perhaps is easier to understand as a causal factor. Uh, but over time, we have to be slightly cautious about how we interpret this flatness that we see here because, of course, with uh, the low education group, what's happening is that over time, the number of people that end up in that group, is uh, that, that's decreasing. So more people are getting to higher levels of education. So what potentially is happening is that uh, the, the smaller numbers of low educated people are ending up being more and more concentrated within the most deprived parts of uh, society. So there's uh, further investigation that needs to be done there to interpret this flatness uh, appropriately. Uh, however, we, uh, uh, in terms of our takeaway from that, so it is work in progress, uh, but the education does seem to be uh, uh, increasing in terms of its importance. However, uh, what we still believe, at least for the Danish data, is that the affluence data is a stronger predictor, so that would be our, our a first uh, index to, uh, of choice to use when we're looking at mortality rates and predicting mortality rates. And this stronger predictor, this conclusion, is even when you allow for the fact that uh, we have a larger number of subgroups, uh, 10 subgroups rather than the, the three that we have for education. So when we take account of that, affluence is still better than education as a predictor. And then, uh, just for example, when we think about this uh, flatlining that we had for low education, 
uh, this divergence is uh, uh, more than we would see in the affluence groups, but that divergence is similar to what we maybe see in some other countries, and including the uh, United States. And uh, it's through the, the detail that we have in this database that perhaps helps us to understand better what is perhaps happening in other countries, because we have the opportunity to dig d much more deeply into the Danish data. Uh, so in particular, we've looked at, started to look at cause of death data. So the, it's been divided up into 29 cause of death groups, um, with biggest differences in the 51 to 55 uh, age group, uh, looking at affluence. Uh, and what we see is that where causes of death are linked to lifestyle, that uh, some causes of death rates are up to 20 times higher. So this would be some things like smoking uh, as a, a sort of uh, causal factor. Uh, where there are particular causes then uh, that are linked to smoking, then we can see that the, the, the low education, uh, the, the low affluence groups might be 20 times higher. But then there are also growing gaps in things like liver diseases, so that, that's linked to alcohol use and uh, diabetes, which would be linked to diet. But then more surprisingly in terms of our research so far is that we see that some cause of death groups have, uh, uh, or almost all cause of death groups have a strong statistically significant difference. So that's saying that the uh, low affluence people still have higher uh, uh, death rates across all of these causes of death. So these plots here uh, just give a snapshot of that. So we've got uh, cause of death number four, which is uh, lung cancer and related deaths, and then cause of death nine, uh, cancer of lymphatic or blood forming tissues, which would be, from my non-medical background, uh, comes across as a, a, a type of cause of death where, which is le much less likely to be influenced by uh, uh, lifestyle uh, uh, factors. Um, so you can see the clear differences for the, the lung cancers uh, uh, over here on the left-hand plot in terms of uh, low affluence up at the top, high affluence down at the bottom. This plot in the middle is much more noisy, but you can still see that the low affluence groups are more generally up at the top and the higher affluence groups down at the bottom, but with smaller differences, but you can still see what those differences are. So how do we interpret that? Uh, well, there is no obvious link in some of these cases to lifestyle or affluence or education, and so what the possible explanations might be, and this is my non-expert view, is that the, the actual onset of a particular illness, that that might not be dependent on lifestyle or whatever, but if you are less affluent or less well-educated, then perhaps that leads you to getting a, a later diagnosis and perhaps also, uh, as an individual, you engage less well with the treatment process. So moving on, uh, we've seen what we can do with the Danish data, but what we want to do just to round off now is to think about developing our mortality database, because this is a very important part of extending what we've been able to do with Denmark to other countries. So what we're looking for is to get a, a, a range of good quality and appropriate data, um, and in particular looking at subpopulations with various uh, socioeconomic characteristics, uh, subpopulations of different sizes perhaps, uh, uh, as well as looking at different countries, which of course that, that's the easy data to get. It's these subpopulations that are more challenging. But it's, you have, it's through having access to these other data sets that we can have these more, much more effective road tests of the models that we, we might develop as well as uh, uh, some of the uh, existing models that are out there in the literature. And it's through these road tests that you, the users, can have greater confidence in the, the models that you, you might ultimately use. And then this database, if, if uh, wherever we possible, if we're able to make the data available, uh, we can think about using, making this available as a resource for model developers and also for uh, commercial users. And then lastly, to help to encourage that, but one of the things that we're also looking at is uh, how might we desensitize what, what would otherwise be commercially sensitive uh, uh, data sets? Because of course, uh, some companies uh, might not want to give away uh, publicly what, uh, uh, what types of uh, policyholders they're taking on, etc. So we now come to the, the final poll before we have uh, some a further chance for questions. So uh, for this poll, it's a, an open poll, and what we want you to do is to, now that the webinar is uh, pretty much over, type in three distinct words uh, that you would uh, take away from this uh, webinar. And what we'll do with this uh, uh, 
questions and the, 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 the words that you type in. We're planning to produce a word cloud and uh, if the technology works well, then you'll even see the word cloud uh, growing as, as we speak. And of course, at this point, I, I don't want to give you some examples because that, that would uh, <laughs> just prompt uh, people in terms of uh, what words they might type. So we'll give you a, a few seconds to think about that and then uh, that gives Steve a, a chance to look at what questions are coming up. So let's, um, let's look at some of the questions that have been coming through, Andrew. Um, so the first one is, touches really on what you've just been talking about. The mortality improvement data seems to imply different causes occurring at different ages. Mm -hmm. um, and how is your research going to dig into that? And you've given us a hint, I guess, mm -hmm. via the Danish yep. example. Yep. So at the moment, what we're doing with the cause of death data is really just to look at each little block of data in isolation because the, uh, so within our sort of block of five or 10 ages and also uh, a, a block of five years. And of course, par part of the reason for doing that is that uh, for some causes of death, you have very small numbers of people dying. So you need to group them into blocks in order to get enough data to have a, a sort of reasonably accurate estimate of what the, the death rate is. Um, you can then start to compare, as we've done, the, the sort of different affluence groups. But, uh, but then within a, ca within a particular calendar year, yes, you can start to compare different ages and different causes of death. But then the bigger challenges are in terms of what happens over as, as we go through time. Uh, because uh, the, the challenges being that you have, uh, for example, changes in the way that diseases are classified. Um, but then also there are changes in the way that uh, what, what is the recommended practice in terms within a country in terms of recording the uh, cause of death. And uh, so that, that can be really quite different for some causes of death, very different in some countries compared to others. And uh, I, I would assume that there's a, there is some recommended consistency, but, uh, uh, and, and uh, dementia is one example. So Denmark, the reported death rates from dementia or senility are very low, whereas in the UK, uh, dementia is now the leading yes. cause of death. Yes. And uh, I, I'm sure that that's down to how cause of death gets recorded rather than there being genuine differences uh, in terms of the incidence of that particular disease. So we're proceeding with caution on that front and we're so as, and in particular very cautious in terms of predicting individual causes of death in terms of how they might uh, evolve in the future. Except in some causes of death where it's very clear yes. and well defined and distinct. Um, so another question. At, at the start of the webinar you showed mortality trends at specimen ages, but shouldn't we be looking at cohorts? Hmm. Interesting question. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's certainly not what I al always would look at, al although I have to say that uh, one thing I have done in a, a sort of piece of work uh, two or three years ago now where I was actually uh, looking at the quality of data. And uh, when we were looking at the quality of the underlying national data, one of the things we very much did was to look at uh, cohort mortality and how different cohorts themselves uh, relate to each other. And that revealed quite a lot in terms of where there poten potentially are some anomalies in the, the national data. But then also in the, the, the models that we develop, uh, and you of course yourself have done quite a bit of work in this area, that uh, the models do incorporate uh, cohort effects as well as uh, period effects, and uh, we would certainly be uh, continuing that. So although in terms of plots, we maybe don't focus on that perhaps as much as we should, but uh, when it comes to the modeling work, uh, cohorts are very much at, at, at the center, unless uh, we can conclude from the data that the, in some countries, for example, that cohort effects are not very strong. So I think we've got time for one more question, um, and it's about the comparison between Denmark and the US. So in some of the plots you showed us, the rates were higher in Denmark than the US. And the questioner said they're surprised because Denmark has a free health care and has a reputation of being a happy nation. Mm -hmm. So would you like to comment on that? Are there any <laughs> explanations? Uh, well, I don't have detailed <laughs> explanations, but uh, the, and we, as our, our, amongst ourselves as researchers, we've had lots of debates over what uh, uh, the results are, and, and, and indeed there are lots of 
researchers in the uh, social science area more, more than the actuarial area who've been already thinking about this. And uh, as with the United States, once you start to look at the individual causes of death, then you can start to see particular patterns where Denmark has much higher uh, death rates from things that are perhaps related, and this is particularly in the middle age groups, relate, things related to alcohol and uh, some of these lifestyle issues which are particularly in the, the sort of lower affluence groups. So although yes, uh, that uh, Denmark does have this universal health care and uh, a, a happier nation, that there, there are still some unhappy people perhaps within that uh, country. Well, thank you, a Andrew, for the answers to those questions. Um, I think that now brings us to the end of the webinar. So I'd just like to thank you, the audience. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation and for your insightful questions. And we hope that you found the webinar to be useful and interesting. Thank you.